This is going to be a big and juicy topic. There's something. There's something on that. Oh, well. I'm going to live with this. Hey, friends. It's your good friend, Tim Campbell-Smith, digital marketing teacher, trainer, and speaker. And today, we are talking about something that is really starting to ransack both industries that I work in, which is teaching and training and higher education and digital marketing. And that is ChatGPT by OpenAI. Basically, this is an online platform that creates things based on instructions that it's given. It's AI, so it's artificial intelligence. It's using machine learning to create text and to create things and art when given prompts and questions. A lot of discussion around using it to create content, using it to generate assignments. So today we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about, you know, what is it? What are the limitations? How are students using it? How can students use it? But also what can, most notably, me as an educator, what I'm focusing on is how do we get ahead of it? So it doesn't ransack uh, the education system. It doesn't ransack our classrooms. And what are further considerations? Before we go too far, make sure to like and subscribe for all things digital marketing, teaching, and training. Now, please note this video is going to be a little bit on the longer side and a little bit uh, very juicy actually and below with this video there are timestamps to the important uh times in the video and some links that i'm going to reference so make sure you look at that description as well you're going to find a lot of helpful resources down there okay so let's start with what is chat gpt what what is this thing that we are looking at this is a machine learning program it's a chat bot based on an algorithm that's a mathematical or a computational formula that tells it to do things and it typically creates uh, visuals or text based on prompts you give it or commands that you give it. It is programmed as an algorithm to scour the public internet and to gather information, to learn from that information and from that data, and then to produce an output. So it's taking that input, all that data it's, it's scraping and it's learning from on the internet. It's taking your command and then giving you an output. It's creating what you ask of it. So you can, you can tell it to explain a concept. You can ask it to create a lesson plan. You can ask it to write a report. You can ask it to provide an essay on something. And what we're finding is it's actually not bad. Actually, let's take a quick look here. I had a lot of fun asking AI to create a lesson plan about using AI, and this is what it looked like. Please note, you do have to create an account, but it is free. But I've done this a few times, and it's kind of surreal to actually do this. But I'm going to say create a 60 minute lesson plan on the dangers of using AI to produce assignments in university. And I want you to see what it comes up with. This is what it looks like. So here it goes. It is starting to generate based on a prompt I gave it about creating a lesson plan and it's putting that lesson plan together. Again, you can tell it's not bad. It obviously has some limitations. So as a teacher, as an instructor, I'm noticing a limitation here is this lesson plan isn't terribly interactive pedagogically. It doesn't thrill me because it just looks like a lot of lecture, but it is touching on really big main points. It's covering bases that you'd probably really want covered in this kind of lesson. And it's not bad. Please note, you have this option to regenerate response because it is learning. It is constantly learning from the commands that you are giving it, the commands other people are giving it, and how they use it. And that's part of the, the whole algorithm, right? That it's constantly learning. And in academic settings, we're also finding that ChatGPT can actually write formal structured essays when asked and cite sources. But speaking of citing sources, let's get into some of the really notable limitations of ChatGPT and limitations that are affecting everyone. Please note, some these limitations range from the practical to the high level societal and government. We're going to cover just a few of all of them. But first things first, that does affect the practical, but also affects society. We don't know what it's learning. We even the engineers have admitted they're not sure what ChatGPT is learning and where it's getting all of its information from. We just know that it's gathering a lot of data from the public internet that's generating a lot of a lot of things towards its input so that when matched with a command it's giving an output but we're not quite sure how it's coming to its output and we know that the output changes even slightly every single time as it learns. 
Next, ChatGPT may actually put together and assemble inaccurate information, old information, rebuked information, because ChatGPT still hasn't learned about credible sources, about how things get discredited, how we determine information that is fair and valid. So there's a further gamble with the output, with what it gives you. It may actually give you wildly inaccurate information. And they actually say this in their disclosure on their home screen, that you may get inaccurate information. Kind of creates a bit of a risk, especially in academic writing. Next, and we've kind of already touched on this, the results are never the same. They learn over time, so there's a lack of consistency, which I think creates doubt in the platform and in the users. This algorithm is so large, so complex, and it is scouring and using data that is so large, which is the public internet. The next limitation is that the engineers behind ChatGPT don't even know how it works anymore. They're not fully in control of it. They don't know what different parts are looking for and what it's learning from. So if you have something that's running out of your control, there's a, there's a bigger risk factor there. Next, and this one I am seeing in higher education, it gets citations wrong. It'll give you a citation, but the problem is it reorders it, and we see a lot of citations that are inaccurate. So it'll give you a last name, you know, last name, comma, first name. I, I'm used to teaching and using APA, uh, which is, so I'm, I'm kind of describing my formatting that way, but it'll give you last name, comma, first initial. It'll give you an article title. It'll give you a publication and a year. But the problem is that author may not have written that article in that year and in that publication. It's just pulled a title, a author, a year, a publication, and you know put it together, and it's not actually real. So it's not getting its citations right. Next, and I see this, I, I teach business and, and application-heavy business courses. It ChatGPT creates and writes in generalities and lacks specifics. So like in my, my one class where I teach entrepreneurship, uh, I ask my students to create a business. And ChatGPT cannot really give you information that is unique to your business. It only writes in generalities. So it lacks specificity and we have to keep adding that. The other big limitation with it on a societal level that we're seeing is that algorithms, right, and machines can only learn what we tell it to learn, these algorithms are, are born with biases. And because it's only as good as the data that is given to it, it has the biases and the discriminations of data. It's why we see, for example, uh, discrimination in hiring processes, because algorithms inadvertently learn to prioritize um, white men, right, over women, even though they may have a better resume, because of inherent biases in the programming and the algorithms, it causes discrimination. Well, ChatGPT is also picking up on biases and the isms and the phobias, right? So racism, xenopho uh, xenophobia, homophobia, Islamophobia. It's picking up on these things and doesn't know that it's showing that. And in that, it also doesn't get conversational tone right because it either doesn't use it at all or it uses really inappropriate conversational tones that are rooted in discrimination. So there's, there's quite a few limitations that are limiting how successful this whole thing can be. So now we know what it is and we know some of the problems with it, but let's talk about how students are using it, how teachers and how teachers can use it. Students are right using it really for the whole gamut of experience. So to come up with ideas and to brainstorm, which I actually think is a clever and a smart idea, they're also using it to write full reports, they're writing it to find sources, and they're using it to write full supplements or to supplement work, or even to su supplement a whole work. But again, you know, it can't successfully on its own supplement a whole work. You would have to review it. It requires human intervention because the writing style, the writing tone, citations especially, and it still requires review. And something that's really frustrating for instructors is that we're finding students are using these tools and they're not proofreading it. Either they don't want to, they don't have time, they don't think about it, um, or they don't know what they're looking for. So there's some, some limitations there with how students are using it. But let's talk about teachers. Let's talk about what can teachers do and let's make this actionable. Please note my suggestions that we're gonna cover in this video are gonna range from the simple to the extremely complex. And it depends on what resources are available at your school. I teach at two different schools that have two very different sets of resources available to us and different protocols for how we do this. So 
I'm coming from a range of experiences as well. And also some things that I researched in preparing for this video. So the first tool that you can use, and I just love the name of this, please note there's a few tools, but I love this one, Hugging Face. Linked below, Hugging Face has an AI writing detector, so it can tell with a certain level of probability what the chances are that a piece of text was written by AI. So just like we have uh, people who commit crimes, we have people who uh, detect and prevent crimes. Same thing with uh, writing AI that produces text and art. You can use Hugging Face to detect if a piece of text was written by AI or by a human. Next, you can actually just try and out and out ban it altogether. Ironically, at one of the schools that I teach at, we where we take plagiarism, copying, and cheating very seriously, using this tool just on its own is, is what we call contract cheating. You're contracting out or getting someone else to write something for you. On its own, this could be enough to get an offense and to get into a lot of trouble. So you can try and out and out ban it. However, what do we know about human behavior? People are still going to do things that maybe act against their best interests or that they shouldn't. So there's a bit of a risk with that one, but that's one thing you can do is you can just name and claim and say, this is outright banned, don't do it, it's not allowed. Next, and this is the, the kind of the approach I'm taking in my teaching practice, you can teach healthy and appropriate use of it. Remember, a, a goal of technology in and humanity is to use technology to better and further humanity. So I'm thinking, you know, it's great for brainstorming. It's great for coming up with ideas. So I'm going to facilitate a session with my students on how to use ChatGPT to brainstorm ideas, to provide lines of inquiry, and as a springboard for assignments, and then to stop there. Next, and part of the act of facilitation and teaching happy, healthy uses of it, remind and teach your students about the limitations of ChatGPT and some of the problems it presents and its effect on their academic performance. So I'm telling my students, it's really great to get the writing process starting. It's a great starting place, but then you'll have to do a lot of revision. You still have to understand it. You still have to review it. You still have to correct it. It still requires a human intervention. So remind your students, human intervention is required. It does not free you from learning. It does not free you from having to produce assignments. Next, and this is also something I'm doing though, penalize students and tell students that they are held accountable even if the program generates similar works for multiple people. So in my last class that I had, uh, I had a lot of students, and this is how I found out that students were using AI to write assignments. My students for a section in human resources, a lot of them wrote about transformational leadership and they wrote about it in the same way even though it's not something we ever taught in my course and it's not something we ever taught them in the program. And not many of my students had post-grad experience and would have learned about transformational leadership. So all of them got penalized for copying, even though, and they all said, I didn't copy. Well, and I've now realized like, oh no, technically they didn't, a machine did. But because they didn't proofread it, because they didn't you know, use human intervention, because it looked like copying, they were held accountable for it. You can still penalize your students for using this and if it generates similar work. Next, in my research on this, I found a teacher who in their class had their students sign a contract. All the students were over the age of 18, which is the legal age in Ontario and Canada to be signing contracts, had their students sign a contract saying, I will not use ChatGPT or other artificial intelligence to write assignments. So they kind of have a binding contract. I don't know how binding it is. I don't know how effective that is. I think it's more about like the ritual of signing saying, I will not do this thing. But one teacher had people sign a contract. Some teachers I heard, and, and this is kind of a mixed bag, are moving to all writing and assessments that involve writing being done in class so that teachers can monitor and supervise and make sure that no one is actually using artificial intelligence. So that's another one. And then the final possibility, and I'm excited about this and actually integrating this into my teaching, but it's to it involves moving away from assessments that involve a lot of writing and research. So doing more tests, more exams, more presentations, more creative displays that are harder for artificial intelligence to create or replicate, and just moving away from writing. Is just some other further considerations. One, with the rise of technology, please remember I, the guiding question that I kind of agree, especially when it comes to ethics and technology, 
is how do we use technology to enhance and further humanity? That means that we don't shy away from it. We don't run away from it. I can't stand this notion or this concept that like some people are not talking about it and some teachers refuse to talk about it. If you don't talk about it, it's going to grow and fester. Talk about it, address it, figure out how to get in front of it and use this as a tool and so that it's not a weapon used against you. Other, and I think this is just like a good teaching 101 tip, talk to other faculty, talk to your schools, your colleges, universities, wherever you teach, talk to others and explore just how others are using it and getting in front of this tool. And my other one is, is use checkers, right? If you can use natural language processing uh, to check it. At one of my schools, we have an NLP um, that we can use, but we need an original writing sample from the student. And then we have to use the next assignment that they submit. But there are some ethical considerations with that There's and dilemmas. There's some logistics with that. Um, some NLPs take a long time to make it work uh, or to process it all. So. But where possible, when possible, if you can use checkers, do use them to check uh, to check the work and to check what's going on and, and make sure that it wasn't written by AI. In conclusion, I know it's annoying. It's annoying. It's a beast. And it just came out of nowhere as well. But the best thing that we can do right now, I think, is to embrace it, to find a way to use this to our advantage so it's not weaponized against us. And I think it's important that we keep learning from others. As educators, as marketers, as humans, the best thing that we can do is band together and learn from each other. So comment and let me know, how are you getting ahead of this? What are you finding in your classroom with ChatGPT and with artificial intelligence for writing assignments? And how are you getting in front of it? I'd love to keep this conversation going. And remember to like and subscribe for all things digital marketing, teaching and training. Thanks friends, we'll chat soon. Bye for now.